This 96th Founders Day by joining together in the singing of the first stanza of our national anthem. remain standing for our invocation by the Reverend Ebenezer Offel. Let us pray. Our wonderful creator, we recognize your sturdy hand that has brought us to this point where we can celebrate and dispatch this wonderful class of 1993. We recognize the many people who have supported us, encouraged us, motivated us. And now, as we dispatch them into the larger world, cognizant of their incredible abilities and their demonstration that courtesy, courage, compassion, and unity can all be bedfellows, as we dispatch them, when they go in their separate ways, should the sound of compassion and courtesy and dignity be strangely silent from their relationships. Lord, may they not look for the address of nobility from the yellow pages, but open their eyes to see nobility in the immediate other. When they are confronted with injustice, inhumanity, all oh, give them that strength of will and purpose to stand tall, let them launch out the moral missiles against the forces of injustice, indecency, inhumanity, and indignity until those walls that separate us and that make this world so uncomfortable be crumpled and this world become the world that you wanted it to be. Make these young men whom we are so proud of worthy ambassadors of goodwill even now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Ninety-six years ago this month, on June 25th, 1897, Gilman School, then known as the Country School for Boys of Baltimore City, came into existence on what is now the Homewood campus of Johns Hopkins University. Since the first graduating class in 1903, Founders Day and Commencement have been celebrated as one ceremony. This special occasion is a time to mark the completion of studies of new graduates, and also to reflect upon the founding traditions of Gilman. The highest level of academic achievement in the graduating class is recognized by selection as valedictorian. This selection is based upon a weighted average of class standing during the four upper school years. The formula which we use to determine the valedictorian is one which takes in several different variables over the entire four years of the upper school. This year, for the first time in the history of the school, two outstanding young men ended up with identical averages. 
We are not in Baltimore County. <laughs> so this year, we are going to be presenting co-valedictorians, each of whom will deliver a valedictory address. Our first valedictorian is a young man of great academic talent. Our speaker, who will be attending the University of North Carolina on a Moorhead scholarship, has been an officer of his class every year. This year, he was selected as president of the school, and he has served magnificently in this capacity. A winner of several leadership and academic awards, including the University of Virginia Book Award, which is given to that member of the junior class who, who displays, quote, extraordinary academic achievement, extracurricular accomplishments, integrity, and character, end quote. In his spare time, Michael plays on two varsity teams, football and baseball, Su serves as a leader of SAFE, and writes for the news. A wonderful leader and a wonderful young man, ladies and gentlemen, our first valedictorian, John Michael McWilliams, Jr. Thank you. Mr. Montgomery, trustees, parents, classmates, and friends, there's nothing I wish more than to be able today to speak to you about forging onward into adulthood and blazing our own unique trails through the trials and tribulations that await our entrance into the real world. But because I'm not yet certain as to how we might go about blazing those trails, I must admit I cannot fulfill that wish at this moment. Much to your relief, I'm sure. Allow me instead to draw from past and present experiences to express something I hold very dear, something I've been a part of for six years, and something that has formed a part of me as well. That something is the spirit of the class of men seated before you. I've witnessed my fair share of graduations as a supportive sibling or friend, and as a restless underclassman fanning myself in the bleachers. And I've come to notice that somewhere in the shuffle of the diplomas, individual awards, and personalized photographs, we often lose sight of the fact that above all, a graduation is the celebration of an entire class, not of any one individual. Therefore, I would like to seize this opportunity to demonstrate and to celebrate the unique collective character of this class. However self-evident that character may be, I feel it is nevertheless necessary to crystallize exactly how awesome the Gilman class of 1993 really is. For I can never allow the level of leadership, enthusiasm, unity, concern, and respect that this class has displayed to the school and to each other to get lost in the shuffle. The strength of the class's character has never been so tested as it was early this school year in the wake of the tragic loss of classmate Matt Kowalczyk. The concern and courage with, with which the entire class carried itself and each other at the funeral was overwhelming, especially as grief-stricken friends were comforted by those seated next to them. Support and concern for Matt's family and closest friends has continued throughout the year and has further sensitized the class to our differences in perception and conviction. Over the years, we have learned to accept and appreciate those differences, as evidenced by the absence of cliques in our class, despite the many small circles of friends. In fact, if one were to have taken a picture every day in the senior room, just before assembly when the room is alive with 40 different conversations. No two pictures would be alike, except maybe for the stains on the walls. Our class has never been hesitant to embrace responsibility and to have fun in the process. Among the many student council activities this year was the reestablishment of the prefect system. In addition to proctoring, monitoring, and tutoring underclassmen, Prefects were expected to be role models and to lead by example. 
Rather than the faculty choosing these prefects, a new selection process was initiated, including voluntary applications and interviews. Except for the senior officers who conducted these interviews, any senior was eligible to apply. And in a matter of weeks, 33 applications have been turned in. That's well over a third of all eligible applicants who were willing to undergo the extensive procedure and to accept the position of responsibility. In addition, of the numerous extracurricular clubs, almost all the club presidents this year have been seniors. Aside from running their own weekly affairs, each club president was asked to put together a booth for the Gilman Circus, a traditional fundraiser that was renewed by senior leadership after a year's absence. A final and crucial organizational meeting was called several days before the circus, and every club president attended. That in itself may not appear to be any great feat. However, unlike the frequent afternoon meetings before it, this particular meeting was to begin at 7.30 in the morning. Now to ask 25 high school seniors to arrive at school almost a full hour before classes begin is a bit dangerous. And to believe that something can actually be accomplished is outrageously idealistic. Nevertheless, everyone was there. Maybe not cheery and bright-eyed, but everyone was there. And the circus plans were finalized. It is also a testament of our class's enthusiasm that several of these clubs exist at all. Probably the most active and popular club in the school, the Spirit Committee, was begun just last year by several members of our class in response to the dwindling support for athletic events. What started out as a little rah-rah in the way of banner making, chess painting, and pep rallies, the Spirit Committee has developed into the core of extracurricular support at Gilman, extending beyond athletic contests to food drives, plays, and social events. Less obvious, but just as representative of the class's varied interests and talents, has been the revitalization of the ice hockey program, from an intramural sport to an MSA playoff team, as well as the continued promotion of the dramatics department. Just a few weeks ago, as a culmination of the energy and creativity displayed on stage for years, several seniors put on an entirely student-run and very successful production of West Side Story. Finally, I think it is also highly appropriate to note that even Gilman's new sophisticated computer grading and ranking system could not reduce this class to a single valedictorian. And thankfully so, for no one spokesman could ever adequately represent the group of men seated before you. Thank you. Our second speaker is a young man of prodigious academic talent, who also happens to be named Michael. In addition to his fine record here at Gilman, he has been the mainstay of the school's its academic team, which won the Maryland State title before losing in a heartbreaking last four seconds of the regional finals this year. He has also been a recipient of numerous awards, including the Harvard Book Prize, the Williams Book Prize, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute Medal, the Janvier Science Prize, two years in a row, the Cleveland Essay Prize, prizes for proficiency in French and history, and a faculty award for his contributions to the school. In his spare time, Michael also has served as an associate editor of the yearbook and as a member of the tennis team. He is a talented, sensitive, and inspiring leader of whom we are very proud. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Elliott Ginsberg. Mr. Montgomery, Dr. Neal, Mr. Finney, trustees, esteemed faculty, fellow classmates, and honored guests. Today marks the completion of our high school careers, and for many of us, 12 years here at Gilman. In those years, we have seen and experienced much that has influenced us, 
and these are memories which we will always recall. We will always remember breakfast with Mr. Snyder in the lower school, boundary ball, trips to France with the middle school, explosions in labs, outstanding student theatrical productions, and many other events too numerous to be recounted here. The variety of such experience gives me confidence as I prepare to go off to college. In addition, I am also confident that this is a class that will maintain its ties and its friendships. I'm proud to say this, and I'm looking forward to it in the future. As I sat down to write this speech, I thought about the kinds of people that we are. I wondered what paths we would take, what career tracks we will follow, and what kinds of people we will become. September of this year will find us in universities scattered about the country, and needless to say, I have been thinking about this as well. It is about our coming college experiences that I wish to speak today. We are all familiar with the idea of students going off to, free, going off to college and celebrating their freedom, but I want to talk about a different aspect of this concept, and that is the moderation in the use of this newfound freedom. And by this, I mean moderation in our attitudes, priorities, and values. As we move closer to full independence, we have growing responsibilities which we must balance against this independence. And in going to college, we take on an entirely new set of responsibilities. The college experience, I feel, will be much more enjoyable if we all take a moment to reflect on the kind of people that we have been here at Gilman and the kind of experiences that we have had. As I am but one student, I can speak only for myself. I hope, however, that generalizations can be drawn from my experience that may be useful. I had a remarkable time at Gilman. I enjoyed my classes immensely. I loved and profited much from my many extracurricular activities both in school and in the community. I avidly awaited each television taping of our It's Academic team. I enjoyed athletics as well, and I found that, though I was no superstar, athletics were a good and relaxing break from academics. I have inklings as to what I want to pursue in college, both in and out of classes, based all upon my experiences here at Gilman, and I can look back on these years as very, very enjoyable. Yet, as I look back, I also see that I very often slipped into a somewhat one-dimensional existence, dominated by my love for academics and leaving room for little in the way of an outside social life. In retrospect, it is hard for me to pinpoint where this occurred, but it is an unmistakable fact that leaves me somewhat dismayed. It was not hard for this to happen. In fact, I had hardly started to realize this fact until this, my senior year. I simply set for myself academic goals which I considered then, and still consider now, to be important and worthwhile. Yet in so doing, I failed to recognize the tendency to slip into a one-dimensional existence, and perhaps did not develop as fully as I might have in my high school years. I do not intend, however, to make this same mistake twice. Having identified this shortcoming, I intend to devote serious time to developing friends and becoming part of the social life in college. This does not mean an abandonment of academics. It is simply my feeling that the one-dimensional individual is unhealthy and that balance is necessary to fully develop one's potential. What I did in devoting myself to academics others may have done with regard to athletics or extracurricular activities or even social life. And that is to allow a positive interest in one of these areas to dominate all others to the detriment of total individual development. The theme here is that of moderation. We cannot go off to college bent on achieving success in one particular area of our lives, be it social, athletic, or academic. We must approach college with an open mind, ready to accept new ideas and new values, and desiring to experience the totality of university life. 
Moderation also means accepting and welcoming people into the social ranks, even if their attitudes and values are different, especially if they make an attempt to join these social ranks. It is open-minded contact with these different beliefs that will enable us to grow and mature further. In addition, moderation and open-mindedness allow us to experience new ideas in new areas, areas of varying degrees, particularly in this coming critical period where we will be choosing our future careers. There are other areas in which the theme of moderation is applicable. Many of us talk about not being able to wait to get away from home, away from parents, away from any familial authority. And while this may be understandable, we may be a bit too zealous in this attitude. Though we must acknowledge the change in family structure, we ought not burn our bridges to our families completely, for we can count on no one else so unconditionally. But our transfer to life at college will, of necessity, give us greater freedom of action from our previous sources of authority. Thus it is imperative that we recognize that with our greater freedom does indeed come greater responsibility. No one at our colleges will complain to our parents about our grades or our effort or our behavior. There may be no professor that reminds us our papers are late and there may be no sympathy in grading. We will truly be on our own to sink or to swim. We will have to recognize this fact and accept it. We will have a measure of responsibility that is extremely weighty, and we will have to balance this against our other collegiate goals. When we arrive at college, we arrive with a new beginning. We likely will know very few people, so shared past experience is uncommon. We are thus provided with a rare opportunity to change ourselves and our attitudes. It is an opportunity for a sort of personal mid-course correction that comes rarely in life, but is upon the graduating seniors now. College is a period in life to be enjoyed. Our Gilman experiences have prepared us to face both the new freedoms and challenges of the new world of college. But we are all capable of doing many things to making this experience even better. If we can develop the attitude of wanting to learn for its own sake, and not to merely rack up high grades or achieve a high class rank. If we can cherish the opportunities for personal growth and maturation and for developing social skills. And most importantly, if we can see the value in accepting others for their intrinsic worth, even if their values are at some variance with our own, we will derive the most from our coming experiences. Before I conclude, I would like to thank on behalf of the class, Mr. Montgomery, Dr. Neal, Mr. Finney, and the many wonderful faculty members and administrators who have been an essential element in our progress at Gilman. Our teachers have always taken the time to explain difficult ideas to us, and they have always been willing to share both their learned knowledge and their personal experiences. To them, we owe a great deal. On behalf of the class, I would also like to thank our parents and siblings for all their support over the years. We have all been provided a foundation upon which we may build the rest of our lives. Thank you. Before proceeding to the presentation of awards, I would like to echo something touched upon by both Michaels in recognizing the class of 1993 and its accomplishments. And I do this really in a personal sense. Their accomplishments for the school and for the community have been considerable. Just as important for me, however, has been the help they have given me in my transition year and becoming accustomed to the school, its traditions, I discovered that I could rely on this year's senior class. They provided leadership in moments of trial 
and they pro provided inspiration and moments of celebration. And I am tremendously thankful to them on a personal level for what they have done for me, the school, and the community. So thank you all for making this academic year a good one. I feel very fortunate indeed to have inherited a school with such an outstanding group of young men leading the student body. Most of the awards which are described in your program were presented at our special awards day ceremony on May 28th. The names of the recipients of all prizes have been print printed in the commencement issue of the Gilman News, which will be available outside the Finney Center after these procedures are concluded. As was mentioned on awards day, Gilman School is deeply grateful to all of the families and individuals whose generosity and continued interest make possible the many meaningful prizes which are presented. We are especially grateful for the wording of the citations, which emphasize achievement in many areas, as well as qualities of character and service. I now ask Mr. Mercer Neal, head of the upper school, to join me in presenting the final prizes. the William S. Thomas Scholarship Prizes. For highest scholarship, emblematic of the first academic ranking in each class, have been provided by the will of Mr. William S. Thomas. Listed in your program are the names of the person in whose honor the prizes are given. Will the following, who are this year's leading scholars in their respective classes, please come forward. Third form, ninth grade, David S. Lee. Fourth form, 10th grade, Karthik Balakrishan. Fifth form, 11th grade, Neil Branch. Sixth form, 12th grade, John Michael McWilliams. And valedictorians, Michael Elliott Ginsburg and John Michael McWilliams, Jr. I also call your attention to all of those seniors who have achieved cum laude. You will note in your program the names of those boys who are admitted to the cum laude society, either as juniors or as seniors. On behalf of the faculty, I congratulate these students, along with all upper schoolers who have achieved academic honor roll. All students who have achieved the academic honor roll, or the equivalent of an average of 85 or over, will be notified in the mailing of the final grading report. The William Cabell Bruce Junior Athletic Prize is awarded to that boy in one of the four upper forms most conspicuous for general proficiency in athletic sports and exercises over a two-year period. And this without having incurred the reproach of questionable con conduct in any respect. It gives me great pleasure to present this award this year to David Bernard Shapiro. The Peter B. Blanchard Award goes to that boy who, by his cheerful helpfulness, in many ways has greatly contributed to the successful and pleasant life of the school. The award always goes to the students who are considered especially helpful 
and sensitive to the needs of others. This year, the award goes to two boys, Jonathan Githens Mazur and John Paget Goodell. The Edward Fenimore Award is awarded to that senior whose Gilman career has been marked by extraordinary courage, determination, perseverance, and accomplishment. These qualities were especially evidenced by Eddie Fenimore while a student here at Gilman. It gives me great pleasure to present this award to Sebastian Arana. The Daniel Baker Jr. Memorial Award is given to a member of the graduating class who, through thoughtfulness and by reason of his life and character, has contributed to the general welfare of his fellow man. It gives me great pleasure to present the award this year to Frederick Matthew Buck. next award is the Redmond C.S. Finney Award. This award was established in 1992 in honor of Mr. Finney, who was headmaster of Gilman from 1968 until his retirement in 1992. It is given to that upper school student who has distinguished himself through action and example by encouraging harmony through his dedication to and practice of those human values necessary to eliminate racism, prejudice, and intolerance. It gives me great pleasure to present the first Redmond C.S. Finney Award to David Bernard Shapiro. William A. Fisher Medallion is awarded on the basis of scholarship, leadership, and character to a boy of high scholastic standing who, in the opinion of the faculty, has re rendered the highest service to the school. It is indeed an honor and privilege to present this award to a young man who fulfills the criteria of this distinguished prize to an exceptionally high degree. John. Michael McWilliams, Jr. Gilman is fortunate, fortunate not only to have outstanding students, but also a distinguished faculty. It is fitting, therefore, to take a moment at this ceremony to pay special tribute to some of our faculty. It has been a long tradition at Gilman to recognize each faculty member upon his or her completion of 20 years of service to the school. It gives me great pleasure this year to present engraved plates to three members of the Gilman faculty. Each has been a member of the faculty for 20 years. Robert D. Bulkley, Ronald 
L. Culbertson, and Robert J. DeMuel. I now call your attention to the second to last page of your program, which makes reference to faculty support funds. These awards are approved by the Board of Trustees. Gilman is deeply grateful to Mrs. Edward K. Dunn, her daughter, Anine, and her two sons, Edward K. Dunn, Jr., Gilman, 1953, and Pierce Butler Dunn, class of 1968 for establishing a fund in honor and memory of Mr. Edward K. Dunn, Sr., an alumnus of the class of 1918, who served Gilman as a trustee for an unprecedented 44 years, including the presidency of the board from 1949 until 1956. It has been the special wish of the Dunn family that these awards go to young faculty members who have made an exceptional contribution to the development of the character of students and who will be encouraged by the award to make a life commitment to teaching. Three members of the lower school faculty and one member of the middle school faculty were honored as Dunn Fellows on the occasion of their respective commencements last week. As I call out their names, I ask them to stand and to face the audience. Mrs. Diana P. Matthews, Mrs. Rennie Wilder, Mr. Lorne Thompson from the lower school, and Mr. Peter Quitterovich from the middle school. The class of 1947 Meritorious Teaching Award was first presented three years ago. The award is supported by a generous endowment which was raised by the members of the Gilman class of 1947. This year, the award is being presented to a member of our upper school faculty who has served with great distinction and dedication. He began his teaching career at Gilman in 1958, and in the 35 years he has been a member of the Gilman faculty, he has served in many capacities, including head of the history department outstanding history teacher and exceptional coach. His career at Gilman has been exemplary. It gives me great pleasure to present this year's Class of 1947 Meritorious Teaching Award to Nicholas M. Schloter. The Dawson L. Farber, Jr. Faculty Award. This award is donated by John Armiger, 61, in honor of Mr. Dawson L. Farber, Jr., class of 1935, who has served as a member of the Board of Trustees since 1964 and who was named a lifetime trustee in 1981. Mr. Farber has shown exceptional interest and support of the Gilman faculty. This award in Mr. Farber's honor goes to that faculty member deemed most helpful to his or her colleagues. This year, the award was presented to a member of the middle school faculty who fits the criteria of this award in almost every way. I ask Dr. Marty Malloy to please stand at his seat.
the Edward T. Russell Chair is presented each year to a Gilman faculty member who has been especially devoted to the school and who helps to perpetuate the life and ideals of Mr. Edward Russell, a distinguished teacher, coach, and counselor on the Gilman faculty for an unbelievable 48 years. He also maintained a close association with the school for 11 years following his retirement until his death in 1974. The award this year was made to a middle school faculty member who has been teaching at Gilman for 17 years. His distinguished career has been exemplary in terms of both dedication and creative and imaginative teaching. Will Mr. Donald Abrams please stand and be recognized. I would now like to call upon the President of the Board of Trustees, Mr. George Hess, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Arch, Dr. Neal, Reverend Affle, members of the faculty, distinguished class of 1993, ladies and gentlemen. In 1979, one of Gilman's lifetime trustees, Dr. Theodore E. Woodward, spoke to the medical graduates of the University of Maryland School of Medicine. One of his comments was so meaningful to me that I thought it bears repeating to you the class of 1993. He said, and I quote, don't underestimate success. Define it for yourself now. At this point in your lives, there is a great temptation to measure success based on your grades at Gilman, the awards you receive at the school, or the colleges that have accepted you. I'm here to tell you that a short time from now, you will not define success by any of these measures. The sooner you start to think about the definition of your success in life, the sooner you can begin the process of achieving it. Success is not difficult to achieve if you clearly understand and define it for yourself early in life. And if your initial definition is not correct, there's nothing wrong with changing it. In my office, there is a needlepoint picture of a turtle with a caption below it that says, the turtle never gets anywhere unless it sticks its neck out. This philosophy has been imbued in all three of my sons who graduated from Gilman. And as a result, they all are working to achieve their own defined successes. They seem challenged and happy. Perhaps a story about someone you all know and respect will emphasize the importance of these statements about success better than anything else I can say. In 1975, a young man graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. His goal was to go to law school and he believed that if he graduated from law school, became a good lawyer, and went into politics nationally, he would be a success. In order to go to law school, he needed financial aid, and he determined that the best source of that for him was the Army. He completed law school at the University of Texas and came to Baltimore in 1982 to practice law with one of its premier law firms, Venable, Bacher, and Howard. Along the way, he met a wonderful woman, Phyllis, and determined that being a good husband and father were a part of his goal for success. They had two sons, Gregory and Tyler, and he has had lots of fun being a good husband and father. But alas, the original career goals for success 
did not make him happy. So he left Venable, Bacher, and Howard and went into education. He became a teacher at the St. George's School in Newport, Rhode Island. The whole process of working with young people became a new measure of success for him, and he realized that he could be very happy helping them to make the most of themselves. Someone from Gilman realized that he could be a phenomenal head for the school after Mr. Fin Finney retired and suggested that he apply for the job. As Professor Larry Gibson said in his wonderful address at the baccalaureate service yesterday, by any measure, an appraisal of Mr. Archibald R. Montgomery Force first year as Gilman head would show a great success. So, class of 1993, I challenge you to start college with a set of values. These values will help in your personal code of conduct as well as setting a future course for your life. Add family along the way and include them in the formula. As Ted Woodward said at the close of his talk, quote, your labors have been know that if we can help along the way with your problems, we would be glad to try, unquote. I know that I speak for all the faculty and trustees of Gilman when I say that we are rooting for you. Be like that turtle and stick your neck out so that you can get somewhere. Determine your definition of success and go after it with everything you have. God bless you and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Hess, for those kind remarks. Uh, members of the graduating class, I know that you are eager to get the show on the road, but I'd ask you for one more moment of brief indulgence. Mr. Hess said some words about success, and I would like to leave you, as you were poised to leave Gilman, with a final thought in that regard. Please continue to do what you have done so well this year. Live in the present. Measure your success from day to day. I hope you will all strive for lofty goals and that you will stretch your talents, but do not measure yourself by your progress down some artificial path. Instead, you are a, you are a success on the day that you live your life with integrity humility, honor, and selflessness. On some days, you will be more successful than others. Success, when measured this way, is never a battle won. Instead, it is an ongoing process, complete with triumph and disaster. In coming years, if you measure your, yourself in these terms, you will be a continuing story of success. There are examples from this year of your success that I could point to, many of them. I offer here only one quiet example to illustrate what I'm speaking of. In writing to his church youth group, Jerry Lee said in part, quote, life, especially high school life, presents to us numerous temptations and a tremendous peer pressure to succumb to these temptations. In the world today, there are many obstacles that we must face. Thus, it is essential that we maintain healthy, loving, understanding, trusting, and godly friendships with one another." End quote. In pursuing this vision, Jerry, and many of you behind me, immersed himself in Gilman School. He gently worked as director of our daily bread, as a volunteer for Upward Bound, and a wide variety of unheralded volunteer activities. 
You may not have heard any of these things about Jerry. You may have, his classmates, no knowledge of the many things he has done. Yet, he is a success in the most meaningful sense of that word. I urge you, the class of 1993, to take your diplomas from Gilman and succeed every day in the ongoing process of living your lives with integrity, humility, honor, and selflessness. We now come to the presentation of the diplomas to the members of the graduating class of 1993. This part of the ceremony represents the most significant event in the life of the school. Prior to asking Mr. Hess to begin the presentation of the diplomas, I would like to express gratitude to a special group of people who not only have made the financial sacrifice to send their sons to Gilman, but they have steadfastly supported both their sons and the school along the way. These people are our parents. In recognition and appreciation of the vitally important role parents play, and in particular recognition of the parents of the members of the graduating class of 1993, I ask you to join me in a standing ovation in tribute to them. The diplomas will now be presented by the President of the Board of Trustees. The order of distribution will be alphabetical. Before we begin, I, I do want to pause for just a moment to remember uh, wonderful qualities of Matt Kowalczyk. Uh, Matt inspired in all of us qualities of love, and respect and sensitivity because he seems so often to exhibit them himself. And if, as we've talked about success today, success is really measured by the impact that one has on others, then Matt's impact on all of us represents his ultimate triumph and his ultimate success. So congratulations, Matt. Nicholas Floyd Adams the fourth. Sebastian Arana. Reed Armbruster. Gregory Edward Bader. Bryce Christian Baradell. Patrick Eric Bass. Matthew Charles Baum. <laughs> Mosey Kadeen Bennett. <laughs> Brian Stephen Berg.
William Wirun Boone. Sanjoy Bowes. Edward Bennett Bourne. Frederick Matthew Buck. Robert Vernon Carr, third. Christopher Stedman Carroll. Brian William Chang. Keith Chol Choi. William Higgins Conkling III. Benjamin Randall Corotis. Ronald Robert Crockett, Jr. <laughs> Damien Dijon Crowder. <laughs> Matthew Forbes Dent. Edward Comegius Ducart III. <laughs> Timothy Edward Elliott. <laughs> Sheldon Matthew Frazier. Stephen Larry Gibson. <laughs> Michael Elliott Ginsburg. <laughs> Jonathan Gizzons Major. John Paget Goodell. Andrew Scott Goodman. Neil David Granick. Jack Symington Griswold, Jr. John Jonathan David Hammond.
Gerard Charles Harrison. <clears throat> Michael Henke. Randall Whitfield Higgins. Christopher William Love. Anthony Ryan Hodson. Amit Rohan Tour Joshi. Joshua Kendrick Julius. Stanley Quang Yul Kim. Tobin Arnold Kim. Jason Israel Clayton. <laughs> Lewis John Kasouris III. <laughs> Damon Lauren Krieger. Michael Charles Kunzelman. <laughs> David Ross Lapides. <laughs> Jason Derek Lear. <laughs> Gerald Changyun Lee. This is Lee. Oh. Congratulations. Thank you. Very good, Mike. Thomas Sung Lee. Gregory Paul Lessons. John Wade Levering. Jeremy Holden Levy. <laughs> Ken Yu Lin. Mark Vandenberg Lord. Timothy Brewster McCall. Mr. 
Mrs. Marbury? Okay. William Marbury. Juan Dante Massey. <laughs> Nicholas Radcliffe Marmony. Charleston Blake McAllister. <laughs> Peter Rosal McGill, third. <laughs> Stephen Austin McIntyre. John Michael McWilliams, Jr. <laughs> Ferris Fatin Mud Harris. <laughs> Stephen Daniel Ness. Tony on Nguyen. <laughs> David Eric Olson. <laughs> Robert Nelson Oster. <laughs> Thanks, Nelson. Charles Councilman Owens, Jr. <laughs> Nicholas Barrett Owsley. Ashish Prafal Patel. <laughs> Panet Thomas Pinnett. David Baker Powell. <laughs> Peter Joseph Rothman. <laughs> Thomas Edgy Russell Fourth. Charles Adele Sansour. <laughs> Michael Edward Saunders.
Robert Michael Shapiro. Eric Todd Schlein. Kevin Charles Scott. David Bernard Shapiro. Mark Thomas Shavers. Joseph Graves Short. Alexander Russell Slager, Slagel, excuse me, second. Brian Robert Smith. Adam Mitchell Spivak. Joshua Adam Steinitz. Hakeem Erfan Sturet. William Curtis Stifler. <laughs> Raul Swanee. Matthew Allen Tucker. Christopher Lee Uttermole. Christopher Richard Van Bergen. Jeffrey Craig Wilkie. <laughs> Thomas Jackson Winstead.
Reddy did me a lot of favors, and one of them was warning me about this. Before the singing of our concluding hymn, I would like to remind the audience that all of the students, trustees, and faculty intend to recess from this hall immediately following the benediction. Underclassmen will go first as directed by the ushers, followed by faculty, trustees, and seniors in this order. We will now conclude with the hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, and then the final stanza of America. Thereafter, please remain standing for the benediction by the Reverend Ebenezer Offel. Let us rise and sing, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Let us open our hearts to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord drench you with the favor of his presence. May he soften the parched grounds before you, encourage you, motivate you in every way to make the reality possible where in our world the lamb and the lion can lie together. Amen. <laughs>